Stelios, do you remember that balloon that floated menacingly over the US a couple of months back? Yeah. Yeah. What was it? It was the spy balloon. Was it a balloon or...? Yes. So, I mean... I mean, everybody was all over this at the time. It was like a fad for a week. It was in the news stories. And, and everybody was convinced it was a Chinese spy balloon. Um, you know, the right and the left were convinced of this. Um, the, the, the left was saying, okay, yeah, it's a spy balloon, but, you know, don't worry about it too much. We can't shoot it down because, you know, you can't just go shooting stuff down over the, over the US. And the, and the right was saying, yes, it's a spy balloon, but you've got to shoot it down. It's the right thing to do. And eventually the compromise was they let it fly out over the other side and then they shot it down and then they recovered it, right? Now, Amongst that um, further, there was, there was one man who doubted the narrative on that. Let's have a look at this clip. I interrupt this segment to bring you an important message about this stuff, the dollar. Um, not going so well, is it? Inflation is out of control and debt is even more out of control. In fact, the US government is on the verge of spending a trillion dollars a year just servicing its debt. It spends about 6.6 .6 trillion and it only collects about 4.6 trillion in revenues. So you can see that this situation is, uh, you know, rapidly taking a turn for the worse. You might want to consider some gold and silver. And that is why that we've done a partnership deal with GoldCo and we've created lotusitasgold.com. Go and check that out. It's an offer for our American viewers. You can transfer a proportion of your IRA into this. And if you do so, you're going to get some of this lovely stuff, some, some, some bonus silver thrown in on top, uh, up to $10,000. Or you can even take delivery of the physical gold to your home address if you prefer. So if you want money that goes clang when you put it down, check out lodizedisgold.com. And I just look at this and like I say, yep, fine. Maybe it is a spy balloon. Maybe it's all of the things that it just said it is. It just feels that for me, that narrative is just too convenient. It's too playing into the narrative that I've seen building before every war that, that I've seen in my lifetime and probably every war that occurred before that, yep. which is the ramping up of that tensions of that, of the othering of, of the, you know, of, of let's get one over on them. So wise man, that is, is this the man, the notorious man who won, who won against Clint Eastwood in the "Who Would You Marry" yes, competition? That one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so I that that segment, I sort of go through my reasonings as to why I think there's something else going on, which is a uh, building up attentions against the against the China, and this is basically a useful mechanism for that. But the logic just didn't make sense to me for it actually being a spy balloon. So anyway, so so that happened. They shot it down. Um, and then what happened is you then had um, the, the the US basically flying around shooting down a whole load of balloons, including one hundred and eighty dollar um, school's hobbyist balloon that they sent up, and and the US Air Force came along and shot it down with a four hundred thousand dollar sidewinder missile. So that went on anyway. So where are we now? Five months later, after this story, which only one brave man said is uh, is not what it seems. Well, we've got this writers. Reuters article. So let's have a look at this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read you the key bit, which is uh, Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder told reporters, uh, we assessed that it did not collect while flying over the US. The balloon did not transmit any data to China. It never collected any while flying over the US. Right. So uh, it, it, it didn't do any spying. Um, it didn't even collect any data. Um, and he said, uh, we are aware it has information gathering technology. I mean, there are people who are in the mood of shooting stuff in, on air for a hobby. Yeah, but I don't, I don't want uh, $100 balloons being shot down with $400,000 Sidewinder missiles. I mean, I know they like debts and deficits, um, <laughs> a bit like we do, but that, that is a bit ridiculous. So he said, so he said that it, it did have information gathering technology, um, but it wasn't used. So what, what do we mean by information gathering technology? So a, a microphone or a camera of any sort, which you'd expect to find on a weather balloon, um, you know, had that. Anyway, so, so basically you, you get into this, um, the, the follow-on story from this. It, it turns out that this balloon five months ago, it didn't have any special equipment at all. In fact, all of the equipment on it was standard equipment that you could buy um, retail. Okay. And actually, the vast majority of it was American technology. So you could have recreated that balloon by going into retail stores in the U.S., so, you know, not, not a spy balloon, not an EMP device, uh, you know, not the next generation of, of radar technology or anything like that. Um, but, but this is the sort of thing. So um, all of these stories, they come along and, you know, they, they capture everybody's attention. And then they let out a little 
um, addendum to it, you know, a little follow up that, that goes on like page seven of, well, I don't know, nobody knew. Usually they break the news when there is another event and they ha- we have stories yeah. like that, you know, nothing burgers that come out of nowhere yeah. to divert public attention. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that's a lot of what it was. And actually, if you follow this one through, it turns out that, that basically what happened is um, the um, the land-based radar systems received an upgrade. Yeah. And after they received an upgrade, they started picking up loads more stuff, including these little hobbyist balloons and, and, and this one. I mean, this one was quite large. Um, it was visible from the from from the ground, which is which is yeah. which is what got them there. But um, basically, they they the new new radar system got upgraded, got a whole mode more stuff. Um, big story for a week. Um, lots of furore. Um, lots of ratcheting up against tensions against China, um, and then the correction comes out, and I bet nobody noticed the the correction. I mean, I I, I managed to notice it, but I mean, I, I could have easily missed this one, so I felt the need to do a follow up, and I almost didn't do a follow up until I saw something which I thought was actually vaguely connected. Did you catch um, the the pod on Friday where Carl was talking about UFOs? Um, now I thought, oh, that's bloody interesting because yeah, that well, it's an interesting subject, but I, I hadn't picked up on the um, on on the hearings either. So so I I I I saw Carl's segment on that, and then I went and started having a look at um, 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 you know the, the the hearings that sat underneath it. Now in the segment on Friday, Carl was um, fairly open minded towards the idea of aliens actually being here. I seem to remember that he wasn't always quite so open minded on the idea of aliens. Let, let's watch this. Hello, freak bitches. There was a WikiLeaks that was just released today about NASA knowing about aliens. Really? Yes. Bollocks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, basically, quick out for eight from that. Um, so that was a that was a Joe Rogan um, thing between Carl and, and, and Rogan. Um, I think back in 2017. Um, and that was really when things started to get ramped up. There was a New York Times article that came out then, which was like pushing this stuff. And and basically, it's been really interesting since then because there's been a constant drip, drip of stuff coming out of the US government saying, oh, maybe aliens, you know, maybe you might want to check this yeah. out. And, and they and they kind of leak it out in this give, sort of... Give, a, give us a bit of homework. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, we're not, we're not saying anything, but, you know, maybe aliens. Right. Anyway, so so this is this is a typical example. This is this is a more recent thing. This is a NASA briefing uh, on UFO sightings. This is an example of one that I showed at the hearing recently. Uh, this is a spherical orb, metallic, in the Middle East, 2022, by an MQ-9. I will come back to the sensor question that David raised here in a moment. This is a typical example of the thing that we see most of. We see these all over the world, and we see these in and making very interesting apparent maneuvers. This one in particular, however, I would point out, demonstrated no en- enigmatic technical capabilities and was no threat to airborne safety. So, I mean, this is one example. This is a NASA, NASA briefing, but, I mean, the, the, uh, the Navy has been releasing a whole load of footage of stuff like this. Um, where they show you these like fast moving orb type things going around. Um, I'm, I've seen some some counter perspective that says actually the fast moving stuff is um, a, a little bit suspicious because basically if if you have a fast moving aircraft um, monitoring something that's actually moving reasonably slowly, but the fast moving thing is looking down on it and then the, the thing is sufficiently high. Basically, the optical effect as you go past is that it's moved that the thing is moving very fast over the land, but actually it could be moving quite slowly okay but anyway so but there is definitely a feeling that the 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 u.s establishment wants us to be discussing the possibility of aliens thus this meme which i just thought was um yes yeah i just if if you are um listening to this and you get the opportunity to 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 take a look at the uh the podcast there was a there was a beautiful meme there i won't spoil it for you right anyway so unidentified flying objects doesn't have to be aliens Oh yes, it means we yes. haven't identified it yet. Oh yes, but there was yes. So I agree, but there was a lot of hinting. Yes, um, that that's exactly what it is. Okay, um, because you so know, it was the, identified then. Well, no, it's not. But the but they're, they're, unknown to the public object, flying object. Yes, yes, um, and, and actually, this is one of the things that I was going to mention it, but I, but I'll mention it now. Um, uh, a lot of it comes back to the same issue as we talked about before with the with the weather balloon thing. It, it's it's 
it's an upgrade to the radar sensor. So the upgrade to the radar sensor got that balloon that we had in April, but the military um, guys got their upgrade in the early 2000s. Oh, okay. Right, and then when they did that, they started picking up a whole load of more stuff, these little blips, um, which were probably, again, balloons, most of them. And when they when they got this um, big data set of unidentified stuff, they were able to identify about half of it. Yep. And that was, and the half that they did identify were balloons. So, so maybe the other half is like, yeah, all aliens. It's it's Zargon coming to you know to spend a weekend in Vegas or whatever it is. Um, but anyway, so so the UF the UFO hearings that uh, that Carl alluded to on Friday, um, yeah. So so these guys um, came up. So this this David Fravar, the, the Ryan Graves, and and the, and the David uh, Grush chap. So I, I I spent the weekend um, skimming through on two X speed as much of this as as I could to sort of get a get a feeling for what's going on. So 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 let's dig a little bit. Let's start with that David Fravar guy. So. Um, that was one of the original Tic Tac um, viewing um, footage that came out. So he was a, he was a Navy pilot, and basically in 2004 he says that he had an encounter with an alien craft that lasted about five minutes. What what how, what was the nature of his contact? Because um, there are people who yep. write books about their encounters yes. of uh, fourth kind, and they're, they're weird. So, so basically what he was saying is there was a disturbance in the water that looked like it could be a submarine or something like that, but there was some, something going on under the water. And then this, this Tic Tac thing came out and sort of flew around a bit and, and, and spiraled around a bit. And, and there's some footage that's been released of this stuff. And um, things. The, the problem is, is that when you look at the footage, is it's completely unremarkable because it's like, you know, what the hell am I looking at here? Um, but what makes it credible? It's just a flying object. You don't know what it well, is. Well, I mean, I, you, you don't know. You don't know what you're looking at. So, yeah. so the footage itself isn't that remarkable. But it, what makes it remarkable is is the narrative that gets laid on top by the pilot, because the yeah. pilot is a credible, respectable person, um, elevates the footage that would other, otherwise seem remarkable. So, the combination of the two, okay. the, the testimony and the narrative, and the, and the footage that goes with it, and because actually, again, with that footage, a lot of the stuff could be explained by optical illusions and so on. Like there's there's things about them rotating in another one, which which could be linked back to the camera system and all, all this kind of stuff. But anyway, so so he so he's a pilot, and he said he saw this thing for five minutes. Um, his um, his wingman, uh, who was actually a, a wing lady, um, Alex um, and Dietrich, um, yeah, you scorn don't, on you that. don't want to be sexist with. No, so wing wing person, how, whatever whatever we describe him as, but um, wing officer. Yes, yes, perhaps that. Um, so so she's poured scorn on the idea that it was a a five minute encounter, which she described that would have been a lifetime in in observational terms. It was more like ten seconds at most. Um, but actually, I found her interesting as well because she's spoken to some reporters. She she didn't come onto this thing, but she has spoken to reporters, and what she describes is that when they got back to the Nimitz and you know said we've seen this unexplainable thing um the, the the basically the senior officers just weren't interested they just, yeah. they just didn't think it was important so either um they've seen enough pilots misidentify something or they're read in on the alien situation or they've been told um oh your naval research is testing some drones if your pilots see anything just dismiss it but they didn't seem particularly bothered about what was going on. And that was a consistent theme as well. Um, Ryan Graves, he, he's on there as acting well. Acting as if they knew what it was. Or well, acting it, as if... What she says is, is they, just, they just weren't that interested. Yeah. It's, it's like, well, you know, if, I mean, if, if I walked who, into the office... Who cares? Yeah, and I said, uh, oh, um, yeah, I met um, Zarg on the Destroyer outside. He's just landed. And I, I, people would be like, oh, that's interesting. There, there would be a bit of, there'd be a bit of reaction to it, as, as long as you believe me, right? Yeah. Whereas she went back to the Nimitz and said, you know, we, we've seen this thing. He's like, mm, okay, right, fine. Anyway, so Alan Graves had that as well. So he, again, is a, is a um, former Navy pilot. And he claims that his um, squadron saw UFOs every day um, for a period of months between 2014 and 2015. Um, he says he never saw them himself, uh, but this wasn't a military training area. And it was a lot of blips after they upgraded their radar system, which which is my link back to the original story of the of the Chinese weather balloon, right? Um, and also, we know that the training area that they were in, we now know, isn't that far away from a Chinese spy base in um, Cuba, I think it is. Okay. So again, you know, what were they? Were they balloons or something like that? Because a lot of them were just blips on the radar, but they Too didn't see. Too many balloons. Is it like it or something? What? what? From the horror movie with the balloons, you know, Pennywise. 
Oh yeah, too many balloons. Yeah, I don't think it's those sort of balloons. I don't think it's like yeah. the, the red ones. I think <laughs> I think I think it's something else. I think they're like silvery metallic type things, but or whatever. But anyway, um, and 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 he he relates the story of basically um, I, I can't I, I can't remember if, if this was his story or one of his or somebody that he worked with, but basically two airplanes flying along, um, and a um, a balloon type thing with like a what like like a cube inside basically whiz past between the two planes at incredibly close range. Yeah. Right? Um, and again, he went back to the, um, I can't remember if he was the Nimitz or, or something else. Uh, or he, might, he might be been um, Theodore Roosevelt. Shit, whatever. Anyway, so so he goes back there and to start, starts describing this to more um, senior pilots because he would have been quite a, a young man at the time. He would have been a, a, you know, a, a fairly young pilot. Um, and apparently the senior pilots looked at the footage for about five seconds and then just shrugged and walked off. So again, the same experience. The more the, the, the more seasoned officers didn't seem to think that this was a thing and didn't really respond to it. Yeah. Um, but they're convinced that they saw something remarkable, and you know it's become a bit of a thing for them. And these guys have been talking about it for years. Um, and then you've got that guy in the the middle, the, the David Grush guy. Um, so he's a former intelligence officer. And again, um, I find it interesting that he doesn't say anything. That he he doesn't say that he saw anything firsthand. You know, this is all second. So no one saw anything firsthand. Well, David, from David, uh, no, Fravor. David Fravor did, um, but the rest of them seem to see it all seem to be secondhand stories. And and the Gush guy is basically explaining how um, um, the 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 U.S. has uh, crashed alien spacecraft. Yeah, uh, they have non-human bodies have been recovered. I don't know what they mean by non-human bodies. Was it you know was it a Soviet chimp? You know, smacking buttons, or I—I I, I don't know. But, but anyway, non non human bodies have been recovered, um, and basically, his answer to every question um, was, um, "I can't talk about this in an open setting." So you know, let let's have a closed session, uh, and I can tell you much more about the specific questions. Yeah. So I mean, there was a lot of excitement ginned up for this. I understand, um, hoping that because these men are made extraordinary. Was he claims. called there to testify or did he go to testify? Because otherwise it seemed a bit like a gossip. Like gossip. Yeah, well, I, like, I, I think the way it works I have is, something yeah. to tell you, but but I won't say, I can't say it. Yeah, so, so the way I think it works with these things is you are formally called to them, but these guys have been putting themselves out there doing interviews and, and having discussions um, and, and basically making a lot of noise about what they've, their experiences for a long time now, so they would be the logical people to reach out. So, so, so they, so they were, they were summoned, but I think they were, they were perfectly happy to have that. Another thing that I found interesting um, is they all cite a New York Times article okay. um, that was hugely influential. This is the 2017 article that I, I, I pointed to earlier. Let's uh, let's see if we can throw that up on the screen. So, um, yeah, that yeah, that's the one. Um, so this this New York Times article was cited by all the guys in the hearings multiple, multiple times. They kept on saying, I urge people to go and read this article. So uh, for those of you who haven't read it, let me give you the highlights. It talks about the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. For years, the program investigated reports of unidentified flying objects according to a Defense Department officials, interviews with program participants, and records obtained by the New York Times. The program produced documents that described sightings of aircraft that seemed to move at very high velocities with no visible signs of propulsion, or that hovered with no apparent means of lift. Officials with the program have also studied video encounters between unknown objects and military aircraft, including one released in August of a whitish oval object about the size of a commercial plane chased by two Navy fighter jets from the aircraft Nimitz off the coast of San Diego in 2004, which I think was that, that David guy. Um, the program collected video and audio rep recordings of reported UFO incidents, including footage from a Navy aircraft surrounded by some sort of glowing aura traveling at high speed as it rotated as it moves. The Navy pilots can be heard trying to understand what they're seeing. There's a whole fleet of them, one exclaims. A 2009 Pentagon briefing summary of the program, prepared by its director at the time, asserted that what was considered scientific fiction is now science fact, and that the United States is incapable of defending itself against some of these technologies discovered. Well, yeah, I mean, the, my obvious reaction to that is going to be that the United States doesn't know how to do defense anyway. It only ever does attack, and it and it lost against the Taliban, who are wearing sandals. So, I, so you know, space aliens with access to four dimensional physics, um, I, I would say, stand a pretty good chance. Um, I've actually done a brokenomics on um, on on this alien stuff not too long long ago. So that's that's going to be my plug. Yeah. So so uh, uh, broke brokenomics aliens. Um, basically, I go into I go into there into 
uh, my reasoning on, on what I think is happening, and I, I sort of break it down sort of, you know, maths wise as, as to what I think is going on. Because, you know, basically my pitch in, in that one is that um, I think there are definitely alien civilizations out there. Okay. Right, and my logic for that is because the universe is a massively big place. And, and I, I, I use a sort of um, a trick to try and explain how many stars there are. But um, right, imagine, right, Elon Musk, right, he's got $150, mil, $150 billion. Yeah. But right, imagine every dollar was a star. Right? That's still nowhere near to the amount of stars in the universe. There's way more than 150 billion stars in the universe. Right. What if you yeah, took because the visible universe is in the entire universe. Yes, yeah. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Um so what if you took what if you took every human on earth and you made them all as rich as Elon Musk and each dollar was a star, would you now have the amount of stars in the universe? No, nowhere close. Okay, what about if you add in all the mammals? Nope. What if you add in all the fish? Nope. What if you add in all the like all, all the uh, birds. No, still nowhere. So if, if you took every single individual, and I'm not talking about species, I'm talking about every single individual, fish, bird, mammal, human, and gave them all 150 billion, and each each dollar represented a star, you are still nowhere near to the amount of stars in the universe. In fact, you have to add on insects, because there are thought to be 10 quadrillion insects yeah. on the earth. But if you add those on, and you make each individual insect as rich as Elon Musk, and each dollar represents a star, right, finally, you're up to the amount of stars in the universe. So it, it is a phenomenal amount of stars out there in the universe. Right? And, and, and like you say, and, and it's even debatable, we know how big the universe is because of the observable compared to the, you know, compared to the whole thing, right? So basically, through sheer weight of numbers, I find it almost inconceivable that there aren't other sophisticated alien te- uh, civilizations out there. The problem is, is like they're, they're very far away, yeah. And and speed of light is a big limiting factor. So so then I turn it around and say, okay, well, how likely is it that they've come here? Right. And the argument there goes, right. Um, wh- why would they even look at this in the first place? For resources. Well, well, I yeah. So I I, I don't even agree with that bit, right? But but I'm, I'm thinking about what what would have alerted them to to us being here because because the thing that a lot of the alien people um, agree is that these things started showing up after. Um, after the nuclear missile tests, nuclear yes. weapons went off, and that makes sense because that is a that is a pretty clear signal that 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 radiates out into space that somebody is doing something interesting on that planet. But the problem is, right, is that that propagates out at the speed of light, right, and then they'd have to come back here at the speed of light. So let's say that they were able to come back at ninety percent of the speed of light. Let me just uh, say, uh, be yeah, I, I don't, a you're, contrarian. You're, yeah, you're, you're going to go to the the, the trans dimensional travel stuff. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, let, let me finish my thought. It's, it's I, only from yeah. our. Sorry. Yeah. But I'll finish my thought now. But the thing is, if, even if you say, okay, they had instantaneous travel here, right? The, the sphere of knowing about us, because this, this information propagates out at the speed of light, right? So you can basically then say, okay, well, that's the sphere around our planet because the bombs went off, whatever they were, like 60 years ago or something like that, or, or 70 years ago. So, so it has to be within a 70 light year um, radius. But they would have been alerted to the fact that we're here. And when you calculate the number of stars in that system, and then you r- run it through the Drake equation, you basically you need to dial the Drake equation all the way to the top. And if there are civilizations living that close to us in that radius, then the number of civilizations in just our galaxy alone is vast. I mean, millions and millions and millions of them. Which maybe, but 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 then I come on to. I'm, okay. I'm not yeah. saying that there are not. I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I yeah. think also that chances are that there is life out there. I don't know the form yeah. it takes, but uh, you never know how advanced it is. That's the issue. Maybe you yeah. know it's from our current physics that yeah. we know that not we think we that nothing is faster than light, but we don't know if they have more advanced physics and yes. other stuff. And in that case, as you said before, we are in a more precarious situation. Yes. Yes, so I I do. I think want, we I do definitely want... need to colonize stars. Yeah, I, I because do. if if there yes. is at the at the event that Earth mm. is being attacked, we need to have a second and other planets. I, I I think if 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 we're being attacked by something that understands um, how to cross interstellar distances, yeah. we haven't. It's just we don't have remotest of a chance. It it would be like it would be like the USS Nimitz going up against an ant hill in your garden. I don't think we, we we stand the slightest chance. I'm I'm not worried about it. But but basically, where I get to in the in in that episode is I then go on to say, okay, there is you can basically track. Um, there, there's like a ten to fifteen year lag between the alien sightings that people see, the shapes that they describe, 
and then new US aircraft um, coming out of top secrecy. Yeah. So all of the sightings in the 1950s were described a shape which then basically closely resembled the B2 yep. when that came out and and so on. You can basically follow it through the decades that you know there, there is a particular shape of UFO observed and then 10 to 15 year, later, years later, either that aircraft then emerges or you then get a declassification of a program that was working on something but then didn't get anywhere and then it's cable okay, was scrapping it so we can declassify it now. And, and in all cases, the, the, the sightings follow the, the test aircraft stuff. Uh, and then basically where I end up with on that one is um, the PSYOP angle of this, which is I can smell PSYOP all over all over this stuff. So so that's interesting. Now, now I also want to address your, your, your trans-dimensional point because what you're alluding to there is don't be constrained by Einsteinian physics, right? Don't, don't think that, okay... Um, uh, I mean, it's a general point about physics. Physics yes. is an ongoing... Yes. Uh, institution. Yeah, so you speak, you speak to some physicists who are just absolutely convinced, no, speed of light... Uh, well, they, well, they don't even say speed of light. They say speed of information, which, which in their mind also covers you know, wormholes and, and all the rest of it. You, you can't possibly travel faster than that. Um, there is you know, looking at um, um, post-Einsteinian physics, which is something that Eric Weinstein um, talks about. We've got a tweet from him here because this, this point that you're making about um, much faster travel came up um and 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 he 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 responded to that um he also sort of go yeah yeah so that, that's the tweet so so when they were describing the uh, you know the uh, the issue of of being traveled you know faster than the speed of light now I, I i have followed up on his stuff and his argument um for how he thinks it could be done right and and he's basically saying okay so if this stuff is viable then there are possibly 10 extra dimensions and it's either six and four, one away or the other. So it's either six spatial dimensions and four temporal dimensions, or or six temporal and 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 four yeah. spatial, right? Okay. Now, you I have try no idea what that implies. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you even try getting your head. Well, okay. So so a, 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 a super dumbed down layman's version of this, yeah. which is which is all I'm capable of giving you, which is like, can you can you imagine a one dimensional um, object? So so basically, I, I, I remember they were saying about Pac-Man that it's two dimensional. Yeah, well, I'll start, I'll start with the string, but imagine a one-dimensional string, right? Yeah. If you had access to the second dimension, you could fold that string through the second dimension, you could make the string cross at points so that you could travel from one end of the string to the other in a moment, okay? Like well, a wormhole. Yes. Right, now, now imagine a two-dimensional object, right? Yeah. If you got a two, like a piece of paper that had no height, because actually a piece of paper is a, is a three-dimensional object, right? Yeah. Uh, imagine a perfectly flat two-dimensional object. If you had access to the third dimension, you could fold a two-dimensional object through it and make it touch at various points. And the same logic goes for if there was a fourth spatial dimension, you can fold three-dimensional space through the fourth dimension in order to, to make points meet, right? Tell us in the comments how you think we can access higher dimensions. By the way. <laughs> that, that doesn't involve an ayahuasca ceremony, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's basically what's going on. But I mean, you try getting your head around six extra spatial dimensions and four um, temporal dimensions. I mean, I, I don't know. Are there, are, are there, is there anyone on the planet who can do this? So basically the point is, if these aliens, yeah. like either A, have the engineering chops to harness enough energy to travel at, say, 90% the speed of light in order to get here, they are so far ahead of us. And if they've mastered trans-dimensional maths and trans-temporal maths in order to, and I don't mean like, you know, when, when I say trans, I don't mean, you know, yeah. but, you know, but... Transcending. Yes, yes, yeah. that, that kind of stuff. So it, if, if basically we're up against aliens that can understand six spatial dimensions and four temporal dimensions, so they're that smart, but they can't get their head around the concept of the ground. And so they keep coming here and crashing into the ground. Maybe, maybe they watch War of the World and they know that the, the minute they opened the, their gates, they had some sort of yeah. uh, germs that killed them. And maybe yeah, but, but, they, they, they want to make sure. Well, but, yeah, but by flying into the ground. Yeah. That's the thing. I think if, if they're smart enough to do all of this stuff and, and cross dimensions in order to travel from one side of the universe to the other and get here in an instant, yeah. They're not going to keep crashing into the ground, are they? I mean, I mean, we've got we've got like Tesla autopilot, which which can basically drive you from your home to the office most of the time without Maybe crashing. It's a drunk and these guys are like a million years ahead of us. something. What a drunk alien pilot! Yeah, so that is that, So that that is basically the closest you can get to a logical argument on this is that 
there are aliens with advanced technology, but in their society, they also have certain demographics that don't behave responsibly. Yeah. And and they basically come joyriding and, and crash into stuff while on the alien version of, of weed or something. But okay, maybe. But <laughs> right. Anyway, so so is there um is there a cover up going on or is there something real going on? Right. So again, so talking about Eric's Eric Weinstein, you know, what 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 does he think is going on with um this? Because what he alludes to is okay, well, where are all the physicists that are supposed to be working on this? Let's see what he says. I've been on this for three years and I can't find anybody who speaks this language, which now that is a huge clue. Imagine that you say that we've lost control of our airspace. We're being menaced, uh, threats to civilian avi aviation, military aviation. They're seeing these things every day. They defy the physical laws and there are no physicists anywhere to be found. That smells like BS or it smells like a pathological level of bureaucratic incompetence. And Marco Rubio and, and Kirsten Gildebrand, if you're out there, um, can you please find out why there are no technically competent people on an area, on an area of national security? And please don't mumble the word stovepipe or need to know or sources and methods. I mean, we had a Manhattan project. We staffed it with physicists. You have a physics problem. If these things are here, Joe, they are here from so far out of town or they are co-mingling with us on earth. I can't tell you which. Yeah. So his argument is basically there. The, the number of people who graduate with a PhD in physics, it's not a big number. You know, you, you can see these people coming through the university system, unless they're running a shadow university system, which doesn't seem right. I mean, you've got a PhD. Ha, is it likely that they're picking up people at 11 or 13 or 15 and then running them through a parallel um, university system to get their PhD? It does, that would be very rare. Yeah, I it, mean, it, it could be the case. Yeah, but it, it sounds right and plausible. Right? Maybe they've found some, you know, prodigies or something. Yeah, but it, does, it prodigy. doesn't seem right, does it? And then, so you can track the number of people who are graduating with, with a PhD in physics. And then you can say, okay, well, where are these people? W you know, where have they gone? And it's not like there's a huge number who the, of them who are dropping off the radar, contributing nothing, but they're just moving to a big house in Virginia and, you know, the whole bunch of them are clustering there and driving off to, um, you know, some intelligence agency every day. That's not happening, right? So, so he's saying, well, if, if we've got um, alien technology, why aren't there a big clustering of people with the skill set necessary to do it? Anyway, in that interview, he then goes on to talk about the, the three types of physicists that you would want. And I cannot for the life of me remember the names of them, but it's, it's three disciplines within physics that you would need if you were going to try and reverse engineer this technology that we, we seem to be seeing, right? And, and, and they're not going off to work for the government and that kind of stuff. Right. Where is there concentrations of people with PhD in physics in these areas? Where are they clustered? And I'm going to give you a little bit of an analogy now for, for my old thing, private equity, uh, because I would often encounter smart people from basically, you know, anywhere. It's, it would be quite common to find somebody who was formerly a barrister or a surgeon or loads of physicists um, would crop up in venture capital and private equity because it's like, well, they just wanted to make some money, right? Yeah. So is there an unusual concentration of them in one place? Well, actually, there might be. So let's have a look at this. This is a website of a remarkably successful hedge fund, um, Renaissance Technology Websites. Can we go to the About tab, please? Can we click into that? All right. And um, yeah, there we go. You can see it there. Uh, 90 PhDs in mathematics, physics, and computer science. It just so happens that there's a New York hedge fund with a remarkable, absolutely remarkable concentration of people with maths and physics degrees in exactly the areas that you would want if you were looking into this stuff. Now, this, this hedge fund is quite remarkable. I, I, I can't quite get my head around what they did because the, the way that I approached it was, was more about um, people and business logic and stuff like that. The, these are quant driven. So these are guys who basically sort of, you know, just do uh, numbers, 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 numbers. This is going to happen and nobody can follow what the bloody hell they've said. Right? But, but their returns are astonishing. I mean, they're, they're averaging over a long period, something like 66% returns year after year, which is, which is just ridiculous. I mean, this is a money printing machine, this hedge fund. Um, now, I mean, sixty-six percent in any one year is is unremarkable, but just trust me, over a long period, that is just that is just absurd. And it happens to have all of these people that you would want if you were running this. So, you know, I'm I'm not. I mean, it might actually just be a hedge fund. It probably is. 
there's like a it's very very probably it's just a hedge fund full of smart people but that could be a possible front for alien reverse engineering i'm just saying okay i'm just i'm just following the logic of, of, of eric weinstein okay right so anyway so what i had been thinking was that all of this right it, it's an either or it's either aliens have, have turned up and they're like buzzing around like drunk aliens like you've said or it's a psyop and I just wanted to throw in one final perspective from, from one guy who sounds quite interesting, one of these UFO-type people. He, he presents a third option, which, no, it isn't, it isn't either a PSYOP or aliens. Actually, it could be both. Let's, let's watch this. It's a distinction between what humans are doing and what is, let's call it, uh, innate extraterrestrial activities. Now, I think the complexity of that is a barrier to its understanding. In other words... In 1991, I had a pretty senior intelligence official who was involved with this subject come to me. He says, if you tell the public the truth about this, the truth is less believable than the fiction we've been selling. So remember that in 1953, we have a document from the director of the CIA talking about the, quote, psychological warfare value of the UFO subject. There's a 1985 CIA document describing the psychological warfare value of their operations in Brazil and Argentina that have been in, uh, abducting and torturing civilians made to look like an alien event. So when uh, someone who's new to the subject, uh, like Mr. Grush, who's quite young, and, and some of these congressmen who are just learning about it, they don't have the information yet, which is what we're trying to get to them, that you have to entertain two totally separate events going on, but they're copycat. So since, you know, if you look at the reverse engineered human craft, we call them ARVs or uh, alien reproduction vehicles or ATs, just advanced technology craft, those simulate uh, an ET craft pretty closely to look at it up close, but in terms of their maneuverability, how they come and go. And we've also created what's called stagecraft to cause abductions of people now, why would that happen? Because they eventually want to sort of have a global militaristic totalitarian grip on, on the whole public about there being some alien invasion. It's like a bad Hollywood movie. But that's been the long-term defense plan. So I don't know if I believe him, because because he's basically saying, oh, yeah, there are aliens who have visited us, and there's also a PSYOP going on. Now, I'm not sure about the alien thing. I mean, I'm not going to rule it out. I'm just going to say I place a low percentage probability on it. However, I absolutely agree with him that there is a PSYOP being brewed up here. And I think basically what's happening is they're letting this stuff bubble along and they're seeing what traction it gets. And they're thinking, you know, could we ever, could we ever do anything with this? You know, if we wanted to, could we, you know, bring in alien lockdowns um, you know the aliens are coming quick. Transfer all your your freedoms and your and your wealth to us. So, look, I don't know. Tell us in the comments what you think. But um, I, I, I'm going with psyop on this one. Thank you for watching that segment from the podcast of the Loath Seaters. If you enjoyed, why not visit our website where you can get the podcast live from 1 p.m. UK time every weekday, full, uncensored, and for free. And for as little as five pounds a month you can access our extensive library of premium content and help us keep the lights on with series such as Brokenomics, hosted by Dan, where in the latest episode he discusses his dire predictions for our economic future. And if you'd like to see the rest of the content that Dan and the team are putting out, you can follow Dan on Twitter at at KingBingo underscore and the rest of us over at at LotusEaters underscore com. Until next time, goodbye.